In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. St. Louis de Montfort's Prayer to Mary. Hail Mary, admirable, uh, hail Mary, beloved daughter of the Eternal Father. Hail Mary, admirable mother of the Son. Hail Mary, faithful spouse of the Holy Ghost. Hail Mary, my dear mother, my loving mistress, my powerful sovereign. Hail my joy, my glory, my heart, and my soul. Thou art all mine by mercy, and I am all thine by justice. But I am not yet sufficiently thine. I now give myself wholly to thee, without keeping anything back from myself or others. If thou still seest in me anything which does not belong to thee, I beseech thee to take it, and to make thyself the absolute mistress of all that is mine. Destroy in me all that may be displeasing to God. Root it up and bring it to naught. Place and cultivate in me everything that is pleasing to thee. May the light of thy faith dispel the darkness of my mind. May thy profound humility take the place of my pride. May thy sublime contemplation check the distractions of my wandering imagination. May thy continuous sight of God fill my memory with his presence. May the burning love of thy heart inflame the lukewarmness of mine. May thy virtues take the place of my sins. May thy merits be my only adornment in the sight of God and make up for all that is wanting in me. Finally, dearly beloved mother, grant if it be possible that I may have no other spirit but thine to know Jesus and his divine will, that I may have no other soul but thine to praise and glorify the Lord, that I may have no other heart but thine to love God with a love as pure and ardent as thine. I do not ask thee for visions, revelations, sensible devotion, or spiritual pleasures. It is thy privilege to see God clearly. It is thy privilege to enjoy heavenly bliss. It is thy privilege to triumph gloriously in heaven at the right hand of thy Son and to hold absolute sway over angels, men, and demons. It is thy privilege to dispose of all the gifts of God just as thou willest. Such is, O heavenly Mary, the best part which the Lord has given thee and which shall never be taken away from thee. And this thought fills my heart with joy. As for my part here below, I wish for no other than that which was thine, to believe sincerely without spiritual pleasure, to suffer joyfully without human consolation, to die continually to myself without respite, and to work zealously and unselfishly for thee until death, as the humblest of thy servants. The only grace I beg thee to obtain for me is that every day and every moment of my life I may say, Amen, so be it, to all thou didst do while on earth. Amen, so be it, to all that thou art now doing in heaven. Amen, so be it, to all that thou art doing in my soul, so that thou alone mayest fully glorify Jesus in me for time and eternity. Amen. Let us pray for all the members of the confraternity and religious congregation, both living and deceased. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. May they rest in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> My dear confraternity members, every year we have 
a retreat for our minor seminarians, which was a few weeks ago. And an important part of the retreat is the book that you read during the meals, the spiritual reading. So this year I chose a book we've actually used before on prayer. A wonderful book. I like to pick it up from time to time and read a section. It's called Prayer, the Key to Salvation by Father Michael Mueller. And he was a redemptorist priest who lived around 1900, the turn of the 20th century, wrote several great books. And as is the case with redemptorist priests, he would travel around to different parishes and give missions. He was quite a good preacher, but also a very good writer. So this book on prayer brings out the absolute necessity of prayer. And he says in here that it is impossible for one who has attained the use of reason to save his soul without prayer. We know that children who die after having been baptized before they reach the use of reason go straight to heaven. But for the rest of us, once we attain the use of reason, we cannot achieve our salvation without prayer. Prayer is indispensable. And he even says something in this book which strikes you as almost disrespectful to Almighty God. I'd almost said approaching blasphemy, but you have to understand what he's saying. And he says, there is a power on earth which has, there's a, which has power over Almighty God. There is something on earth which has power over God. And when I first read that, you think, well, what could that possibly be? And, of course, he's talking about prayer. Because God allows himself to be influenced by our prayers. And there are many places in the Old Testament, for example, where we read how God spared his people when they turned to prayer and they asked forgiveness. Great blessings and miracles. Unique ways by which God protected his people when they prayed. We have the example, for instance, of Judith, who overcame, cut off the head of Holofernes, the enemy of the Jewish people, and others like that. And you always find that they began by praying. Well, look at our Lord's agony in the garden. How did he begin his passion? By prayer. He went into the garden. He said, my soul is sorrowful even unto death. And he began to pray. And he prayed three times, meaning three periods. Prayed for an hour, went back to the apostles, found them sleeping, awakened them, said, cannot you watch one hour with me? Went back, prayed again, same thing. Several periods of prayer, lengthy prayer, and repeating over and over the same prayer. Father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass away. Yet not my will, but thine be done. So we see our Lord giving us an example of prayer before his passion. And of course, throughout his life, his public life especially, we read in scripture that there were times when he spent the whole night in prayer and was often seen going up into the mountain or into the desert places to pray to his heavenly father. He began his public life by a 40-day fast, spending the entire 40 days in prayer, communing with his Heavenly Father. So prayer is indispensable. Now, of course, when we hear a sermon on prayer or read a book about prayer, we can be inclined to think, oh, I need to pray more. But primarily what we need to concentrate on is always striving to pray better. Because it's not the amount of time we spend in prayer, it's how well we pray. And of course, that's something we can always work on, always strive to pray better. And one of the ways by which our prayers are more effective, more pleasing to God, more efficacious, is by having 
what we would call the spirit of recollection, which spiritual writers call the remote preparation for prayer. And that is throughout the day, from time to time to think of Almighty God, to lift our heart to God, to make acts of love of God, to renew our morning offering. So you have this, this kind of informal spirit of prayer that pervades our life. And then when it comes time to pray, it's easier to pray because we've not been so dissipated, so distracted. So let us, during what remains of Lent, the final couple weeks, especially reflect upon the value of prayer, the importance of prayer. Every evening in the seminary, we begin, before we start our night prayers, we first read the life of the saint for the next day. And the Butler's Lives of the Saints that we used last night gave us the saints for today, Saints Abraham and Mary. Now, of course, there are many saints every day. You could read a book like the Roman Martyrology or the complete Butler's Lives of the Saints, and they'll give like a dozen saints or more on any given day of the year. But he chooses one, Father Butler, in his Lives of the Saints, and he had this man, Saint Abraham, who lived in the early church, and he wanted to spend his life in prayer, so he made a cell near the church. And he walled it up, and he lived in this cell, spending his day in prayer. Well, his brother died, and his brother had an only daughter named Mary. And so he took her and took charge of her education and training, and he built another cell next to his, and he trained her in the spiritual life and in the faith. Well, sadly, this niece of his gave up this life. She was tempted by the world and she left the cell and that way of life, and she plunged herself into the world and into a life of sin. Well, her uncle, St. Abraham, wasn't going to give up on her. So he disguised himself as like a pilgrim, and he journeyed into the city where he heard she was, and he searched until he found her. And he brought her back, again, by his prayer, obtained for her the grace of repentance for her sins, and he brought her back to the cell, and she persevered for the rest of her life in penance and prayer. And she was so renowned for holiness that she worked miracles. But here she had fallen into sin, but then was converted. We might say reconverted. And how did that happen? It was his prayers and his persistence, but especially prayer. So it's a wonderful example, again, of the value of prayer and the power of prayer. On one occasion, the bishop told him he wanted him to become a priest, ordained him a priest, and assigned him to go to a certain city that was still completely pagan. So this, I don't remember the exact year, in fact, it didn't give the year, but it would have been in the first couple centuries after the bloody persecutions of the Christians ceased. So in the early church. So he went to the city and he was, uh, he was shamefully treated, he was rejected, he was forced to leave the city three times and he kept returning. And by his patience and his prayers, he converted the whole city from paganism to Christianity. And then he went back to his cell. But that's an example of his persistence, but also his prayer. Because we can accomplish all things by prayer. Remember those words of our Lord, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. And it's interesting, at the Last Supper, our Lord said to the apostles, why do you not ask? Henceforth, henceforth so far, you haven't asked me anything. Ask what you wish in my name. And of course, we have the, what we call the rogation days, the three days right before Ascension Thursday coming up in May, which are the theme, the whole theme is prayer, which is what rogation means. And the gospel for the rogation mass 
is a story that our Lord told of a man who was on a journey. And he came and arrived late at night in this town and went and knocked on his neighbor's door. It must have been his own town, but he arrived, or what, what it was is he arrived at his friend's house and the friend didn't have anything to give him to eat. So he went to his neighbor and knocked on the door. And the neighbor said, I'm in bed, don't bother me. And he kept knocking and kept knocking. And finally the neighbor, just to be rid of him, got up and gave him as much food as he needed to be able to give to his friend that had come on the journey. But it's interesting that our Lord would tell that story. So what is our Lord telling us? That God wants to be bothered by us. He wants to be importuned, the word that's used, by us in our prayer life, to keep asking and begging. And so let us reflect upon that here as we enter into tomorrow, Passion Tide, the final two weeks of Lent, to spend it well, to be faithful to our Lenten sacrifices, but especially to the spirit of prayer, to strive to say our prayers well, and to strive to maintain that recollection throughout the day that enables us to pray better when it is time to pray. Please kneel. St. Louis Marie de Montfort's Prayer to Jesus, which is found on page 30 in the handbook. O most loving Jesus, deign to let me pour forth my gratitude before thee, for the grace thou hast bestowed upon me in giving me to thy holy mother through the devotion of holy bondage, that she may be my advocate in the presence of thy majesty and my support in my extreme misery. Alas, O Lord, I am so wretched that without this dear mother I should be certainly lost. Yes, Mary is necessary for me at thy side and everywhere that she may appease thy just wrath because I have so often offended thee that she may save me from the eternal punishment of thy justice, which I deserve, that she may contemplate thee, speak to thee, pray to thee, approach thee, and please thee that she may help me to save my soul and the souls of others. In short, Mary is necessary for me, that I may always do thy holy will and seek thy greater glory in all things. Ah, would that I could proclaim throughout the whole world the mercy that thou hast shown to me. Would that everyone might know I should be already damned were it not for Mary. Would that I might offer worthy thanksgiving for so great a blessing. Mary is in me. Oh, what a treasure. Oh, what a consolation. And shall I not be entirely hers? Oh, what ingratitude. My dear Savior, send me death rather than such a calamity, for I would rather die than live without belonging entirely to Mary. With St. John the Evangelist at the foot of the cross, I have taken her a thousand times for my own and as many times have given myself to her. But if I have not yet done it, as thou, dear Jesus, dost wish, I now renew this offering, as thou dost desire me to renew it. And if thou seest in my soul or my body anything that does not belong to this august princess, I pray thee to take it and cast it far from me. For whatever in me does not belong to Mary is unworthy of thee. O Holy Ghost, grant me all these graces. Plant in my soul the tree of true life, which is Mary. Cultivate it and tend it, so that it may grow and blossom, and bring forth the fruit of life in abundance. O Holy Ghost, give me great devotion to Mary, thy faithful spouse. Give me great confidence in her maternal heart, and an abiding refuge in her mercy, so that by her thou mayest truly form in me Jesus Christ, great and mighty, unto the fullness of his perfect age. Amen. The Fatima prayer is, My God, I believe, I adore, I trust, and I love thee. And I beg pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not trust, and do not love thee. My God, I believe, I adore, I trust, and I love thee. 
and I beg pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not trust, and do not love thee. My God, I believe, I adore, I trust, and I love thee. And I beg pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not trust, and do not love thee. O most holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, I adore thee profoundly. I offer thee the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in tabernacles throughout the world, in reparation for the outrages, sacrileges, and indifference by which he is offended, by the infinite merits of the sacred heart of Jesus, in union with the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg the conversion of poor sinners. O most holy Trinity, I adore thee. My God, my God, I love thee in the most blessed sacrament. O my Jesus, it is for love of thee, in reparation for the offenses committed against the immaculate heart of Mary, and for the conversion of poor sinners. St. Louis Marie de Montfort, pray for us. Good St. Joseph, pray for us. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, Descendat Supervos, et Maniat Semper. Amen.